Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we're thrilled to be gathering here today around superpowers of scale um, in one of the only ways that we can right now. Um, I'm Isabel Kirkham Lewitt. I'm the director of Columbia Books and Architecture in the City. Um, I'm going to keep this super brief since Andres has assembled a wonderful group of people to intervene um, in how this book and project continues to unfold um, and also to help us think through the sort of messages and questions that it continues to relay and pose to architecture. Um, I thought I'd just start off really briefly by emphasizing this act of assembly. Um, since for me, this is how the book really begins to sort of resist its own relationship to the architectural practice that it also represents. Um, how the book becomes something much more reciprocal and active in the process. It's not just a document um, of a body of work, um, but an argument for a particular political and architectural position, um, an architectural politics that is very crucially relational, that is based on constantly seeing and reseeing ourselves, our bodies, our experiences, our values, our spaces, um, objects, materials, so on, in relationship to other bodies, experiences, voices, objects, materials. Um, there are various assemblages um, that come up across this book. Um, it's also a word that is marked um, in the index quite a bit. Um, but I think that shifting the emphasis today to the way that the book Superpowers of Scale starts to assemble new methods, conversations, and concerns for architecture feels doubly important um, when what is at stake around assembling together right now is so high and so fraught. Um, so I think that's it from me for today. I'm going to just hand things over to my friend, my colleague, previous director, um, of Columbia Books and Architecture in the City, now assistant professor at California College of the Arts and editor of this book, um, James Graham. Take it away, James. Hey everyone, uh, thank you, Isabel. As Isabel said, you know, what a pleasure it is to be convening uh, digitally as one must uh, to be able to talk about this really fantastic book, which uh, I agree with Isabel, opens up so many uh, important questions for the field of architecture. And it's, it's doubly a pleasure to be here because we have such a, a stellar uh, group of collaborators, uh, interlocutors, friends, uh, to think through some of these questions with today. So my role here is primarily also to get things uh, moving along, but as long as I've got the floor, I wanted to say uh, what a sort of thoughtful, galvanizing, and indeed joyful experience it was uh, uh, to collaborate with uh, Andres on this book, to work with Andres and Roberto and Paola and the entire team at the Office uh, for Political Innovation on this, uh, this document. I don't think Andres Haka needs terribly much introduction uh, to many of the folks here uh, if you think about just about any biennial, uh, Andres has been in it and done extremely important work in it, including winning the Silver Line at the Venice Biennale. Um, I certainly vividly remember uh, first encountering uh, uh, Superpowers of Ten at the Chicago Architecture Biennial, which was one of its later stagings. Uh, and uh, Andres may have even curated said biennial that, that you may be thinking of as he did for uh, the super important Manifesto 12 in Palermo or the 2020 Shanghai Biennial on uh, Bodies of Water. Uh, his superb design work, uh, meanwhile, is widely published, widely circulated, and widely admired. And the office always brings a, a sort of sense of seriousness and an inquisitiveness, but also a kind of lightness of touch and a deep playfulness uh, to each of the, the sort of tasks at hand, which is something I find uh, really fantastic about the design work. And as a teacher here at Columbia University uh, GSAP, he's been uh, such a pivotal voice in asking about the transscalar implications of architecture uh, and how architectural research, architectural thinking, and architectural design can be uh, a critical practice as the director of the Advanced uh, Architectural Design uh, Program. So for those of you who may be uh, new to the book, uh, here it is. Uh, and I would say, feel free to begin uh, in the middle rather than at the beginning, uh, because I, I think it would be fair to say that that's where Andres tends to begin a, a research project. Environment and urbanism and sex and domesticity and technology 
and care and real estate and political engagement are all intertwined here. Um, and these ideas move laterally through the book and touch down on each of the sites of investigation that, that takes place in each chapter. Or if you chose, you could begin instead from the back and spend some time in this remarkable lexicon um, of some of the keywords that, that, that run through, uh, through the text that offers, I think, a really great snapshot of the array of uh, people, individuals, sites, and subjects that are being uh, engaged with here. Another uh, crucial contribution, I think, of Andres Haka's work is its incredible inventiveness of format. Architecture has, has long been a sort of object of exhibition and object of mediation. Uh, but Haka brings a sort of heightened attentiveness, I think, to this kind of discursivity of, of architecture. And he's been a crucial voice in expanding the kind of formats uh, of architectural thought. These are not simply films, installations, performances, uh, and projects about architecture, but rather they're, they're a distinct mode of architectural practice itself. And on that count, I want to note the, the really fantastic work of the graphic designer of Laura Coombs, who uh, put this book together, who's rendered all of this sort of experiential ephemeral media uh, in a really remarkably communicative form. Uh, her design, I think, captures so much about the textures and the temporalities and the materialities of uh, the work of the Office for Political Innovation. And so I think this book, uh, which we're, we're gathered here to discuss today, is going to be a really invaluable resource, not only for the types of conversations it wants to bring to architecture, the types of political engagement that we can imagine architecture having, but also for those invested in the, the sort of practice of architecture as a discursive and activist form. And so finally, um, as Andres has sort of said at many moments uh, during the, uh, the sort of long process of working together on this, the, the book has never been about finishing uh, the work, even if we have put uh, a cover on it, uh, which in some ways seals it. Each of these projects, um, as you can tell, even from the design is, is, is something like a, a framed window uh, into a, a sort of deeply interconnected world. And you might even uh, in the Q&A later consider changing the aspect ratio of your screen to get the, the sort of three by four format so you can feel like you're in the space of the book itself. And so to that end, we're extremely excited to have a really remarkable group uh, of folks assembled digitally here to, to enter into these windows with us and to extend uh, the book's world further and the book's investigations even farther. I'm not gonna offer individual bios of anyone here. Uh, I, I hope they're known to you and they're certainly, uh, certainly very findable, but we're very excited to be joined today by Daniel Barber, Tay Carpenter, Beatrice Colomina, Keller Easterling, Dana Fernandez Pascual and Alain Schwabe, Mario Gooden, Jack Halberstam, Anna Maria Leon, Jacoby Satterwhite, Michael Wang, Mabel Wilson, and Albania Neva. And so after uh, Andres will first give a, a sort of presentation uh, of the book to you, and then we'll have a series of interventions from, from each of them. Uh, and afterward, we'll have time for conversation. I'll certainly be keeping an eye on the questions submitted through the Q&A function uh, below. And so without further ado, please join me in a round of clapping emojis for the author of Superpowers of Scale, Andres Haka. Well, thanks so much. Uh, I'm ex really excited to be here presenting this book that uh, was a lot of work, but very, very enjoyable. And uh, I, I want to say that it was, I'm very honored to be part of the, the, the line of books that Columbia Books on Architecture and the City. It's been uh, publishing. It's uh, a great uh, catalog of books where I feel very, very much part of a, a kinship. And also I'm very excited to be surrounded here uh, by uh, people that I so much admire from which I've learned so much and that I, I, I always found uh, kind of a, an opportunity to, to, to enjoy and both uh, celebrate sort of collective intelligence. Uh, and and I, I, I want to say that uh, uh, I'm very grateful to James, uh, to Isabel, uh, and to the, the, the entire office, which is large, the Office for Political Innovation along the time, but very particularly to Roberto Gonzalez, Ludovica Batista, and Paula Pardo that put together a big part of the material of the book. 
and of course to uh, Laura uh, uh, Combs, uh, the designer of the book that did uh, really, really enjoyable and alluring work. I would like to, to uh, share my screen now and uh, share some, uh, I don't know how to call it, but some characters, I would say, uh, that are important uh, for me uh, over the year uh, with regards to my practice and also connecting it to the entire Office for Political Innovation and, uh, uh, and all the people here uh, in many different ways. Uh, but also with reality, this is the world in which we are, a world that operates uh, as things transition across scales and the ways, the forms of politics that are embedded in this world are very much something that is happening as this transition in through scales, through time, through materialities, through physicalities are enacted. And at the same time, I have the feeling that when architects, we talk about uh, the participation of arch architecture in the making of daily life, often we miss that architecture is very much in the way all these things come together. Uh, and that there's always this sense of collective construction that is also giving some space for a negotiated agency to individual participations, but individual participations are never tipped up or uh, self-contained. It's something that is constructed always collectively. Uh, and this is something that I, I, I've been struggled to, to kind of deal with. And that's what is behind this, uh, this book, but at the same time is everywhere we are. Like basically this is, for me, contemporary architecture, what we have in front of us, and it's not only made by architects, definitely, or by things that we identify as architecture and a, a form of a, an alternative knowledge, probably it's, a, it's needed to, to be part of this, to operate in this and to make the best of the architectural capacity to operate here. But this is of course an arena. I have the feeling that uh, this is kind of a secret that was hidden behind cuteness control the way things transition in a, across scales, across time, across uh, uh, materialities and physicalities. It's been something that became a weapon uh, and that somehow requires forms of dissidence. Uh, this is the, the, uh, the, the design of the, mathem the mathematics of uh, the movie Powers of Ten that Judith Bronowski uh, developed in 1968 for the, first, for the second version of the movie. Uh, the rough sketch. This is Judith Bronowski with uh, Jacob uh, Bronowski, the famous scientist and uh, scientific divulgation that did this series of shows in BBC that so much fascinated the images. And uh, basically, he was also the scientist that developed the technique by which the bombs uh, would be uh, uh, to calculate basically the mathematics of the of the way the bombs could be uh, uh, or the the, the 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 target of the bombs could be predicted and calculated, and that was precisely the knowledge that you need as th that Judith Bronowski asked his father to move into this movie. This movie is kind of a uh, it's it's uh, an application of the maths that were developed to bomb uh, uh, Europe, and that was precisely what Powers of Ten was doing to, to recalculate space as something that could be centralized, controlled, and weaponized. And this is something that came with exclusion. And this is one of the photographs of uh, uh, the rough sketch in which basically a virus accidentally, went, while, the, while you did, and I've been uh, interviewing you did for the last three, four years, and you did basically copied by, by accident uh, uh, an image from a scientific book and there was a virus attacking a cell and they were immediately was removed from the, from the movie. So all these forms of material exclusion that came with the actual film with the, with the Sirli card uh, uh, with the, that calibrated the, the Kodak film that was used to the direct identification of the genes with the way gender was enacted socially and materially uh, the center of this kind of heterosexual uh, couple, uh, white, uh, educated, that would read uh, scientific magazines and would uh, have time to uh, for a lazy afternoon on a on a lawn that was uh, planted with brilliant seeds that were actually the result of of uh, a reduction of the amount of species that would be in on lawns uh, was basically what we responded with uh, super with superpowers of them, which was actually an experiment of see how if we reenacted the movie, basically everything would fail. What was the huge material and technological violence that was taken and that was needed to avoid forms of reality to emerge uh, in the enactment of the transition into scales. 
So in a way, this is for me design. This is an interior design project, but interior design is critical, is selecting what are the presences that are composing reality or, or emerge as part of the making of reality. And it's always uh, so much about framing what is left behind, what makes to be likely possible, uh, respectable. And this is by expanding the frame, you immediately see basements and you see this cat, uh, Cat Niebla, who lived in the basement of the Barcelona Pavilion. And by being in the darkness of the pavilion, uh, she was uh, an actor that would uh, uh, contribute to make the pavilion uh, mice free. But basically in doing that, uh, her body was also transformed and she developed uh, atrophia macular. So, so what happens in the cells of the eye is very much both reflecting the contribution of Gata uh, uh, Niebla uh, to the making of the cosmopolitical composition of the pavilion as much as is composed by it. And uh, rearticulating is probably a form of this, is probably the most radical form of design, recomposing the relationships with different actors. Uh, and uh, this is something that of course is embedded in the way our medium is constructed. Uh, our bodies and air come together in these images of apartments uh, sold in re the real state of New York 432 by D-Box. Uh, and this is where it comes from in a way, all these uh, technologies to bring bodies together with air uh, with apartments, with window, with glass, is what architecture is about now. And it's a coordination between the transformation of the air that Bloomberg proposed for New York and enacted since 2011, to the attraction of billionaires, uh, to the way that uh, the participation of architecture on that uh, turned uh, owning the landscape, owning the air, something that could be detailed through uh, the use of ultra clear glass that would make uh, sky look uh, bluer, as it, of course, mobilized silica from, uh, from Illinois uh, as something that could be extracted, uh, transformed in the transformation gas would, from fracking in the Susquehanna Valley would be mobilized with 30,000 miles of polluted aquifers as a result of that. So when we see this, uh, we see this, the way New York pollution was sent uh, to Susquehanna Valley. And then we see who are the victims of this. So what are the other sides? What are the uh, what was left uh, behind the frame? And the way that this translates into spatial conflicts, like for instance, the way this parceling uh, is actually related to the underground uh, uh, consolidation of the mineral assets of the region. And while this is perceived like this by those who live on top of these assets, this is the way it's perceived by the financial markets. These are the, the kind of sites where our work is located. And uh, in a way it's a form of, I see architecture as a form of kind of uh, uh, not something that could start ever as a tabula rasa, but something that is operating an, or, an already existing uh, milieus that could be challenged and where there's a possibility of being dissident. But in order to be dissident to IKEA, uh, campaigns, photographs, uh, uh, showrooms, uh, images that people can relate to, uh, reenactments are needed. And also media needs to be mobilized. And this is, for instance, Candela that by that lives with her uh, daughters, with her grandchildren, with her dogs and cats. And when she was announced, and that is part of the IKEA disobedience, when there was, she was announced eviction, the fact that she was part of this catalog and mo the mobilization of the, of, the, uh, um, of, the, of several platforms of activism paralyzed uh, or, re or removed the order of eviction. So somehow I think that there's a possibility for uh, contestation, for rearticulation, for operating within the existing networks of uh, where, where politics are enacted. Uh, and there's a form of dissidence that could be embedded within. This is what the book is about, which is really not something that can be said, but something that is more of an experiment, an experiment that is very collective. Uh, and it's probably the only book that the, the list of acknowledgements is longer than the, than the uh, introduction. And, uh, and I'm super happy that it counts also with contributions by Keller Easterling, by Beatriz Colomina and Paul Preciado. Uh, and this is uh, super powers of scale. Uh, so uh, super happy to be here um, and have this chance to, to uh, reflect on this, this book. Thanks to Andres, thanks to Isabel and James. 
uh, for the invitation and of course everyone for coming uh, and this, my esteemed colleagues who uh, will be, present, be presenting after me. It's really a humbling group to be amongst. Um, I just want to you know, really take this chance to find some connections and to work through um, uh, some of the issues that, that Andres and his team put on the table through the project. Uh, what I'm playing out here is a, a sort of loose interaction with the book, right? Uh, the kind of images and ideas that it led me to, uh, mostly in relationship to the first uh, set of discussions around uh, historical figures and their kind of legacies and aftermath um, uh, discussions. I've, I've uh, taken some purchase on in my own research uh, thinking through Eames and Mies in particular, uh, to sort of think and you know to think through those figures and some of their adjacent stories, to think about how the sort of scalar challenge uh, that gets played out uh, in Andres's texts in a number of different ways um, is also uh, something of a challenge um, uh, relative to um, uh, systems of energy, uh, relative to systems of energy and relative to sort of ways of thinking oops, about uh, there we go climates and their systems. Trying to get rid of, there we go, okay. So uh, thinking of climates, both local and planetary, thinking, you know, again, across these sort of scalar shifts, um, uh, having spent some time thinking as well uh, uh, about these uh, legacies and opportunities uh, to sort of read the superpowers of scale into some of these other discussions, uh, admit to some preoccupations, right? I mean, even some sort of overwhelming anxieties with some of these questions of scale as we try to engage with them. Uh, in, in a present in which uh, you know, capacity to sort of conceptualize numbers has come to, to overwhelm us. And I'm not gonna be speaking directly to the pandemic, perhaps others who follow will, um, uh, but it sort of hovers as a cloud uh, around what I'm, what I'm thinking through. So refracting, uh, refracting the modern, sorry, refracting the modern across these sorts of potentials and trajectories, crafting this perspective on modernity, right? The revels in its contingency uh, these images uh, that kind of begin to show how oil itself becomes a medium to think about scale, oil in its relative absence in other contexts. I've sort of mapped some of these um, these own sort of charts and, and visions of, of presence and possible futures across kind of shapes of buildings and their forms themselves as charts and media and representations of energetic aspirations, right? Uh, but more frequently today, uh, again, as with the struggle uh, of, of, of scale, documents that conceptualize uh, these different spaces, um, uh, these different environments, uh, the sort of dance with an increasingly relevant sort of applyable or pliable uh, set of histories uh, the, uh, which these assertions of scale invoke, right? Which is to say that uh, part of what, when we're looking back at these pasts is we're thinking about our kind of shift of scalar knowledge uh, in, its, in its various intensities. So I'll, I'll thank Andres as well um, uh, for the opportunity to go first, uh, as, as, I, as I promised, which is to say this initial insistence on the contingency of this rich multi-scalar approach uh, for this afternoon aided, abetted, crosshatched, if you will, sort of arranged uh, as we are uh, through a sort of uh, alphabetical form, the abecedaire, as we were talking about briefly, uh, before as a means, of course, to submit to existing parameters, to resist hierarchies and stratifications, to claim neutrality, to offer a form of knowledge production that not only invokes the kind of specifics or the kind of elaborations of uh, Gilles Deleuze and Claire Frané as they play out in this fabulous interview that I'm sure many of you know, uh, but also a means intentionally or otherwise, I think, to render in relief the sort of challenges of scale, right? The sort of weight of parameters and regulating mechanisms our bedeviled self stratifications, professionalizations, and the sort of crafting of expertise, right? That seemingly inevitably careen towards an index. So something has to emerge. I mean, someone had to go first, right? There has to perhaps be a starting point, however ephemeral, ephemeral, sorry, uh, to go first, but not be primary, a kind of opening out to an undefined non-delimited plane, just as in the kind of multi-scalar and almost a-scalar or I, I kind of think hyperscalar approach of the volume we're discussing, uh, you know, there's always this kind of small point, right? There's always the, the sort of the beginning of the growth. There's always the layer that is the most zoomed out, which is to say we live uh, however much we strain against them amidst parameters and, and the limits to our current means of knowledge production uh, are, are often felt as strongly as the imperative to exceed them. Uh, what came first for Deleuze and Parnay uh, was the animal, A is for animal, right? Uh, of course, other forms of primacy, of registers, of parsing, of data and desire for asserting a coming first, uh, perhaps a, a sort of emergence 
uh, whether in the torqued kind of foundationalism of the bare life or the more general recognition of the bios, the biosphere, uh, the politics that it solicits and the atmosphere becoming this space for politics as this kind of almost kind of uh, emergent itself and missing uh, from the book, a space for politics and intervention, the planetary biosphere and its discrete acclimatized interiors as increasingly determinate inputs into the trajectories uh, our parametric conditions allow. So trying to, again, kind of make the climate understandable according to its possible scales. And this is, you know, in my sense, in my sort of uh, set of, of interactions and engagements with Andres over the years, uh, an opportunity to, to think through some of these issues, uh, able to be approached, right? Able to begin to conceptualize this question of scale for its uh, really operationalism, as dirty as that term often seems relative to a different kind of life on a newly understood planet. So, so the last sort of piece I'll play out just for a second is, is kind of thinking through these knowledges of scale, um, uh, these sort of um, uh, ways in which knowledge itself, uh, uh, scale as knowledge and knowledge of scale become essential in the context of this kind of, again, back to our kind of overwhelming sorrow of the pandemic and the lives lost and scarred, the scales that we've collectively had a hard time imagining and asking about and even uh, sort of trying to experience, not to mention sort of flatten them somehow engage with or wrap our, our, our social mechanisms around. Uh, what comes last for Deleuze and Papne is the zigzag, right? Z is for zigzag, attuned, I think, or let's say resonant with uh, here so many decades later, uh, the graphic and scripted and scaled complications of the present, the longer history that is of the kind of flattening of curves and imagining other trajectories. Uh, zigzag is the kind of way out of these predictions, right? Or the way around the up that is the down, what I like to think of as the largest opportunity we are currently facing, which is the degrowth opportunity. Uh, so we start somewhere by starting at the end with the zigzag and its possibilities. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, Daniel. Um, let me just go ahead and share my screen. Hang on a second, everyone. Okay. Okay, um, so thank you so much for the invitation uh, to contribute this afternoon. Um, it's just a totally remarkable group of people to be part of, um, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation and the kind of thoughts and reflections that everyone will be sharing. Um, congratulations on the book, Andreas and James. Uh, it's, it's truly uh, an amazing project. I think it's full of curiosity and exuberance. Um, which is no surprise, um, knowing Andres as a person and I think as a colleague. Um, so I thought what I would just do today in my five minutes um, is to reflect a little bit on a set of kind of ongoing conversations I've been having with Andres um, as a designer and then also um, as a teacher of design studios um, together. And I wanted to do a close reading of IKEA Disobedience, um, which as some of you may know is from 2011. Um, Essentially, the project kind of disrupts the comfortable narrative of IKEA's smooth and normative consumer culture uh, to instead produce a kind of uh, an installation of counter domesticities using their off the shelf products. Um, and so, you know, so while IKEA gained a notoriety with their flat pack designs uh, with instructions and an array of small parts uh, and hardware for at home assembly, um, or sometimes the kind of impossibility of, of at home assembly. Um, it's really precisely this technique that I think Andres appropriates or really reappropriates through scale. So an idea of dismantling through assembly. Um, and I think this is re really represents a scalar technique that characterizes some of Andres's work, challenging social systems and revealing underlying structures through their reassembly. So in the installation of IKEA disobedience, uh, the logic of IKEA assembly is disrupted and essentially scaled up. So if the system's contingent parts are typically, let's say the bolt, the nuts, the panels, and the whole as the final product or object, here we can look at the sort of instruction manual of uh, IKEA's MyDoll bunk bed. Uh, the project actually takes the objects themselves. So for example, the bunk bed itself, uh, the bookshelves as the bolts and screws. So they become the parts for assembly. And then they kind of consider the object as a component in and of itself. Um, so this is an image of the installation that I think you saw earlier in Andres' presentation, but these new assembled holes have a spirit of exuberance and suspension. 
They don't really try to resolve formally, but rather they become generators, essentially open to action. Um, and the parts or the things uh, are still legible, yet they're given new affordances, new capacities to maybe invite or facilitate actions, habits, or new behaviors around them. And these things register anew at this scale as familiar desk lights um, become both armature and ornament here. Um, the bed frame becomes both canopy and crest, cresting. Um, stack drying racks become scaffold towers and two bunk beds become combined to become a room. Uh, the drawings of the project are wireframe colored line drawings and which like many of the representations of, that Andres makes, and I think this is um, something that people don't talk much about actually is the representational techniques that you use Andres. Uh, they really add new depths to understanding this project. I think the wireframe allows for a layering and a kind of superimposition of elements in elevation without any kind of trimming or masking. There, it produces an oscillating hierarchy showing the simultaneity um, and also the relationships between the parts. So here, for example, you can see the floating bush, bookshelves that are hiding in between uh, the bunk, the rotated bunk bed. It produces a sort of enmeshed contingency, I think. Uh, one of my favorite parts, for example, are um, the spatulas um, that are connected here. They produce the offset from the rotated chair that allows for the hanging of lights or canopy. So here with the canopy, here with the lights. And at the same time, I think the drawings lend the installation a kind of permanence uh, in which the figures merge difference into new zoomorphic holes. So for example, here, the stack of uh, metal drying racks and the desk lamp become a new sort of hole and figure. Um, in the field. So while IKEA Disobedience um, is a project that I think is intended to recalibrate domesticity through scale, I think it also offers a rethinking of things as actants. So following Latour, I think that recognizes the inanimate objects and things around us as part of a mutuality of the material and also of the social world. Um, through assembly, and I think also reappropriation in this piece and in several others, uh, Andres offers an intentional and I think productive misreading of objects to retrain the eye using scale to see what is both above and below, giving reality a new vibrant life. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, party. I love the book. I love everything Andres uh, does. And uh, congratulations also to James and the uh, Columbia Books on Architecture that strikes again. This is a really beautiful uh, book. I'm going to try to share my skin, screen now. Let's see if he wants to. Uh. Mark? <laughs> I cannot do it. Oh yeah, I did it, I did it. I did it. Perfect, thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to focus on on uh, on a very small uh, point, a tiny point in fact, but it's exactly the point at which uh, the tiny explodes into, into the massive. The politics of scale and the dark side of architectural images of happiness that, uh, that uh, um, Andres also referred at the beginning of his presentation. The aims were, of course, uh, always polemically happy. There is every, every image of them is always super, super happy, right? Every time they did something, they photographed themselves uh, as the happy couple with their, uh, their new baby. But the imps, in fact, were not that uh, happy personally, but more importantly, perhaps, uh, this is a front not just to their own personal lives, but also to the normal trauma of war and the Cold War uh, uh, that is just not uh, in the background of their design, but you can even argue that it's built into their uh, design, if you like, as a kind of, I will say now, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder architecture built precisely with the very tools that produce the trauma in the first place. And I want to zoom to, into one uh, example of this, uh, of this, which is the collaboration between the IMS and the MIT uh, scientist uh, uh, Phillips Morrison and his wife Phyllis Morrison uh, for their uh, Powers of 10 film, which is a collaboration that lasted 
between 1968, which is the first version of the film, and, and 1977. And at the center of the film, as you know, and the center of these nested uh, uh, scales that explode precisely, there is a couple, a couple lying on a picnic mat, seemingly disconnected from everything, from the city, from war, from children, from other animals, from bad weather, from electronic signals. It is the very image of uh, disconnection. But the film then zooms out into uh, the scale of the universe, as you know very well, and then back through the so you images and then back through the breast of the man's hand to the scale of the atom. So you can say they are no longer disconnected, but suspended precisely between scales and teething uh, with life, uh, movement, vibration. Happiness then is suspended now in scales. But behind all of this is the deepest uh, uh, thread. The couple, actually, you could argue that represents fragile humanity uh, threatened by nuclear annihilation. And it's not by chance uh, that the view of the couple is, is like a surveillance image. Uh, ultimately, uh, as you saw a minute ago, from outer space, a kind of very cold, uh, uh, cold war image, unthinkable uh, without the Sputnik. Uh, so the untold story, basically, that I found so incredible in this is that the, uh, Philip Morrison was a crucial part of the Manhattan Project. In fact, he did uh, the final assembly of the little boy bomb that you can see here and that devastated Hiroshima, and also completed the assembly of the fat man uh, in the plane itself on his way to, to uh, Nagasaki. He was then uh, ultimately asked to survey the damage in, in, in Hiroshima after the, uh, and after witness this, this uh, incredible uh, devastation, he became, of course, a lifelong uh, pacifist. But putting together the bomb uh, with your own hands, loading it into the plane, as he was actually doing, is so personal. But the effect is so massive, so impersonal. Uh, the object is, is in your hands, and then a whole landscape is decimated. Even the whole planet is under threat. The nuclear bomb itself, you can say, is already the very image of, uh, of power of 10. It goes from the micro scale of the atoms to the scale of the planet within a split second. You can almost see powers of 10 as a slow motion explosion followed by an implosion. Morrison and the Im somehow used the nuclear against the nuclear. In that sense, it's very cold war. The film used presumably as a nuclear uh, deterrence. But uh, one more level, even deeper into the personal, is the fact that Morrison had polio as a four year old and couldn't go to school until the third grade. He was wounded. Uh, from the start, fragile, and this very fragile uh, kid, disconnected. He started to tinker with uh, with radio set, connecting to, at another scale, or maybe perhaps leaving the body, uh, his own body uh, behind. I'm, I'm super struck by the relationship between this very fragile figure and global, and here you have probably around the time that he's working from the, for the Manhattan Project, he's in the desert, clearly, and global devastation. So this very fragile uh, figure, and in fact, it may be, I may need to clarify because of his involvement with all of this may lead to, to misinterpretation that Morrison was a communist and, and, and actually thought that the bomb should only have been used as a deterrent, as a, as a threat, not as a reality, but at the same time, there you have him loading it into the plane itself. So those are the, I suppose, the, the contradiction. In any case, the images of post-war uh, happiness barely disguise the pervasive personal and collective uh, trauma. In fact, the IMS describes the role of the house. And you may uh, remember that I came up with that during my own research of the IMS as a shock absorber, which is a fantastic definition of, of a house. You may have heard all kinds of definition of the house, but the house of a shock absorber. Uh, uh, and the real uh, context, therefore, of happiness is shock or the bailing of shock. And nothing is more shocking, perhaps, than, than scale the instant effects of a one unseen scale on another. In that sense, the polio uh, virus and ancient microorganism unrecognized uh, for centuries, changing the shape and life of the human uh, body and systems of communication already like radio connecting the individual to vast uh, distant uh, community. The house and how domesticates, domesticates the shock of the, of the scale, the terror, of, uh, of connection, producing the temporary illusion of disconnection, of individuality, of personal experience from the massive scalar interaction 
in which life is suspended. The happy Im Ims, as I said before, were not so happy after all. They were accomplished uh, Hollywood actors, professionals. This might be true of many designers, but what is striking here is all the scales on which they perform. Morrison reached even farther. In a sense, he returned to his childhood uh, fascination with radio and tried to make contact with life in outer space. He was convinced there was life in outer space. And he produced this massive antenna called the Big Air. Remember the big, uh, the, the big fat uh, man. And in uh, in the very year precisely that Power of Ten uh, was released. Anyway, I'm out of time, but this is kind of the uh, some of the uh, behind the scenes stories in which uh, uh, with with which uh, Andres transforms our perceptions. And the new book uh, is, is full of the, them and uh, secret lies uh, barely hidden by the seemingly straight facades of architecture uh, and uh, architects and, and projects. So behind the scenes, there is all this uh, crazy stuff going on. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, thanks so much for inviting me to this gathering and congratulations um, to Andres and James and all the other uh, collaborators. When I was writing a preface to this lovely book, and I'll see if I can let you look at it while I'm talking. Um, I thought it, it repeatedly populated an alternative world uh, operating in parallel to the one to which we give so much authority give so much authority to the bombast of solutions and manifestos and the ideational monotheisms of philosophies and universals and we've all of which we've cobbled together to replace some stupid god and the reasoning of the modern enlightenment mind as it's wrapped around whiteness. And culture treats these as so sophisticated when they're so crude, so prone to creating just an oscillation between monoculture doom loops and binary face-offs. And when you try to exit these logics, it turns out that you only have tools for replicating them. So you're drawn back into their vortex and like a, sort of a frustrated child caught in their own clothes. It's hard to get them these ideologies off of your head. But when you're looking at Andre's work, I think you can sort of hallucinate a world in which these habits of mine are, are puny and vestigial. And luckily they only leave behind a blizzard of precipitates, a blizzard made of all the things that don't fit. What you see in the world that Andres has kind of gently designed is all this lumpy difference that thrives outside the cage. It's so graphically clear from all the projects is a spectrum of domestic scenes that take standards, standard objects from Ikea, the one like that Tay was talking about, and winds them into wildly different nests, or this uh, set of objects um, released from the basement of the iconic Barcelona pavilion, objects were, that were suppressed, or beings like, like the cat, the blind cat living down there that are even permanently harmed so as not to interfere with the institution's purity. And then there's just so many other people and things that even when persecuted for their difference and escape and float around in these pages, it would give you a leaky eye to see some of them and hear their stories. But I want to say it doesn't it doesn't just happen because the cage door is open. This is not just a collection of or display of evidence. Andres Hake is a designer. And what is needed now, it seems, is not a more precise measure of the world's intractable dilemmas, its political superbugs, its whiteness, its lethal biological agents, its potentials for climate cataclysm. It seems it's, it's a synthetic design imagination that is needed. Um, and to highlight the name of Hake's studio, Office for Political Innovation, the forms of innovation for addressing these dilemmas aren't just the new technology, the vaccine, the law, the econometric formula, or the data visualization, or the, you know, in short, the solution. 
the forms are forms that encourage relationships between things, organs of interplay, the interplay that makes that blizzard or matrix of activity. It's the resourceful recombination of problems and differences and needs, even injuries, and the mutualism that's central to the abolition of various constructs of that modern mind. And, and culture finds it so difficult to describe these forms of innovation or even to grasp the idea that they are forms of innovation, that that's true may mean that this book also provides an interesting reflection of its readers and in ways um, and the ways in which they're still gripped by ingrained habits. So maybe then it's also an active instrument of design itself uh, uh, from the scale of microns to the scale of territories. Thank you, bye. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for this invitation and congratulations, Andres. One of the largest wallpaper compositions in history depicts a series of imagined landscapes strung together in a continuous scene. Sauvage de la Mer Pacifique, or Savages of the Pacific, painted in 1806, recreates Captain Cook's overseas expeditions. The 12 meter long landscape juxtaposes places, plants, and people that had probably never been in such proximity before. In different grades of lushness and nudity, all were massed together into order to bring the distant exotic into the bourgeoisie salon, like the exoticized Brazilian male escorts in London that make up the pornified stage of the pornified home, the wallpaper compressed around the world journey and hundreds of different peoples, plants, rocks and animals into a flattened unified image. At the very center of the image is a banana plant growing as if the tree were the element most crucial to the ignorant wallpapering Europeans observing the inhabitants of the Pacific for the first time. This spectacle of both commodities and commodified bodies compresses here the multiple scales of the entire Pacific onto a single display wall, as if we were looking at the world from a helicopter view or through the polarized window of 432 Park Avenue. Regardless of the violent massacres that were already taking place as the part of the discovery and civilization of islanders in the antipods, the banana tree epitomized the fantasy of a remote and desirable paradise. But there was one thing that violence could not conquer and transport to Europe so easily the tropical climate. Governor to the English aristocracy, Joseph Paxton was also fascinated by the banana. He's believed to have fetishized his first banana plant in the chinoiserie at Chatsworth Manor, where he was employed by Lord Cavendish. Even if what Paxton saw on the wallpaper was not an edible banana, his botanic love at first sight inspired him to develop machines for growing foodstuffs ill accustomed to the English weather. Bananas flourish at a constant 27 degrees Celsius year round. Like the water lilies in superpower of scale, they require a transnational reality where geographies, finances, and environments, even bodies, are radically rearticulated, as Andres brilliantly puts it in his book. Paxton had to imagine an architecture with superpowers of scale that would enable them to thrive in the colder latitudes and help them acclimatize to Europe just as the network of pornified homes where thousands of humans are today sexualized, exoticized, and commodified in temporary territories. Paxton built large-scale glass structures that could support big quantities of plants from tropical latitudes in temperate climates. In effect, he invented a device that could replicate and commodify weather conditions on Pacific islands. Europeans would no longer need to travel for months to experience exuberance. It could now be brought to them in three dimensions, just as a fortified home does with the illusion of spending time in and with the tropics, enjoying all forms of pleasure from a bed in a basement in Chelsea. In 1832, Paxton Chatsworth Conser Conservatory was the largest iron and glass structure in existence. Iron and glass structures in the form of Wardian cases and greenhouses far from naive technologies, became empire machines, crucial instruments for the colonizations of humans, non-humans, life, and non-life. 
Once climate conditioned enclosures were perfected in Europe, the tropics, as an atmospheric construct, also started to appear in latitudes further north and were brought to Kew Gardens in London, generously supported by patrons like Lord Cavendish. Paxton eventually rose to become the architect of Crystal Palace, a half kilometer long greenhouse he built for the 1851 Great Exhibition in London, while hiding the brutal violence of empire from wider audiences. Cavendish bananas had several benefits over local bananas. They are shorter in size and therefore can be better to withstand hurricanes. They are a very prolific cultivar and so are able to quickly cover large areas of land. Traveling bananas are also a vehicle for bacteria. Moving live specimens pose new challenges for global plant transfer. Before the development of the Wardian case, most crop disease had primarily remained a local problem. However, in spite of its tremendous success, the Wardian's case began to decline in popularity by the late 19th century when scientists first linked it to the global dispersion of pests, for example, the Panama disease or black setoga in monoculture plantations. 40 treatments of fungicide per year is standard, making the Cavendish banana, the banana we all eat, the most heavily sprayed food crop at a global level. As a result, a fifth of male banana workers worldwide are sterile allegedly as a result of exposure to certain fungicides. Ironically, this forced sterility of Cavendish banana workers is what allows the banana to reproduce further. Sperm then becomes an interscalar vehicle in Gabriel Hecht's terms to understand the architecture of bananas and the political implications of monocrop species at a global scale. The global circulation of bananas stopped depending on Wardian or Paxtonian devices a long time ago. Contemporary botanical dissemination relies on micropropagation of certain genome. Used to study the banana's resilience, T8 lead tubes for Panama tissue culture are the contemporary architecture of Paxton's greenhouse. Like the polarized blue windows of luxury condos in New York City, ultraviolet indoor light instead of humidity, sunlight, and temperature is the real accelerator of life. What superpowers of scale teaches us is that we need to dig new foundations in architecture in the same way that glass, windows, blinds, sperm, phones, webcams, air rides, grinder and fracking brokers are constructing landscapes anew. We learn here that the more productive one becomes at one scale, the more infertile other bodies are. Congratulations, Andres. Okay, thank you, uh, Andreas, for this invitation to uh, participate on this auspicious panel, and congratulations on this uh, terrific book that um, undisciplines architecture and says that architecture has not simply been complicit, but that architecture is an agent, if you will, is an agent of superpower in terms of the systems and uh, networks uh, that we find ourselves uh, engaged with. So let's see here. I want to share my screen. Just give me one moment here. Uh, what I've prepared uh, is a, uh, I'll call it a visual uh, essay and um, uh, or meditation, if you will, on truthiness uh, in architecture.
D'abord les mains. Auriez-vous peur Non, mais cette glace est une glace. Et j'y vois un homme malheureux. Il ne s'agit pas de comprendre. Il s'agit de croire. Thank you, Andres. Okay, thank you, uh, Andres, for this invitation to uh, join you in the celebration of this beautiful, dare I say, architectural uh, new book. It's it's almost like a piece of architecture, uh, and it's a real pleasure, therefore, uh, to play with it um, and touch it and build with it. And that's what I want to do today. Uh, I want to draw out the queer implications of superpowers of scale. And it's pretty easy once you've entered through the looking glass to quote something from uh, Mario's uh, beautiful uh, uh, essay that we just saw. Once you've passed through the looking glass of Andre Hacker's uh, world, you really begin to see uh, differently and to see architecture uh, differently. Um, and there's a, a kind of very strong reminder in the book that everything that we call scale is already made to the measure of heterosexuality and heteronormativity. Uh, and so the, you know, the scaled pair here, of course, is the heteronormative couple um, reclining on the picnic blanket. And the universe then becomes a kind of rendering of their world. Uh, and then when we come back and we go into the micro, we're still in the world of literally the white male body. So one of the really important um, impacts of superpowers of scale is its ability to force us to see scale and then see beyond these little boxes uh, that are our lenses for seeing the world and to start seeing otherwise. So a couple of my interests actually uh, overlap um, beautifully uh, with uh, Andreas's interests um, in relationship to queer worlds, the ways in which queer worlds break with the scale of heteronormative uh, vision and heteronormative structures and heteronormative buildings, um, and the way in which uh, queer life can both disrupt but also be reabsorbed into these normative scales. So I want to just very quickly uh, go over a few of these areas of overlap and open onto queer contestations with the notions of scale, queer anti-architectural projects, um, and then queer projects that are quickly absorbed back into uh, sort of capitalist scale. So three areas, I'll, I'll just give you a couple of ideas uh, within each one. Uh, first, urbanisms um, by which uh, Andres directs our attention to quotidian refusals, quotidian modes of living, quotidian rearrangements of the domestic, um, and the forms of revolt, revolt that are embedded in non-monumental and non-mundane uh, modes of living. 
Uh, the second area will be the scaling up and down of gay male cruising, which is addressed in the book in relationship to Grinder. And then I just want to open at the end onto architectures that I think refuse the grid or the box, which as this book establishes is very much a kind of heteronormative uh, frame. So just to say something about the non-monumental and the quotidian. In his uh, project, I care disobedience, Andres offers a response to this normalizing global project uh, of IKEA, and he refuses to accede to the, the notion of these affordable interior designs, and instead draws our attention to everything that falls outside of that frame. Lesbian squats, shared households between non-biological kin, networks created by sharing food or sex or exercise. And through these interventions, we become aware of an incredible sort of messy way of life uh, that opens onto alternative arrangements of community, uh, collectivity, uh, and kinship. Under the heading uh, of wildness in my own work, I've tried to pay attention um, to these forms of spatial disobedience. And I just have three examples here that I think fall uh, under the heading of IKEA disobedience. One in the right-hand corner, you can see a still from a beautiful punk girl film uh, called Times Square from 1980 that is sort of a queer film that never sort of enters into uh, the canon of queer film, but concerns two girls on the run intent upon remaking the experience of New York City from um, the squatting that they uh, do in the piers, the piers that are mostly understood as being a site for gay male cruising in this film becomes the site for building uh, a collectivity of girl punks. And it's a beautiful film that I think participates in that disobedience that Andres is training us to see. The bottom right hand is a still from a film called Born in Flames, which is the attempt to uh, dismantle the uh, fantasy that a new world will be offered to us through uh, socialism and Born in Flames offers us a women's army. It's a film about a uh, fantasy women's army that comes uh, to take over and has anti-rape gangs and so on. And then finally, and I, I won't go into this because I don't have time, it's to say that uh, I've been thinking a lot about Pauline Oliveros's works, which I think are um, an architectural sonic projects designed to introduce everyday sounds into the project of listening and making music. And there I would also place that well within uh, the scale of disobedience that Andreas offers us. Second, um, just to go to the peers uh, for a moment, we think about uh, the piers um, on the west side of Manhattan as a kind of hallowed ground for gay male cruising that has become sort of representative of an anti-capitalist uh, project that remade a site that had been completely abandoned uh, by the city and that was remade through the erotic activities uh, and an architectural uh, projects of the gay men, the drug addicts and the homeless people uh, who lived there. Um, and of course, what we, the scale that then the, the peers appear within now um, is related to the digital architecture of Grindr and the way in which all of that restless, um, beautiful cruising momentum has been uploaded via an algorithm and turned into a form of global extraction. Uh, and I, it, to answer the question of how does that happen, um, I think uh, Andres Hacker's book gives us a really beautiful rendering of how Grindr descends upon this scene of disorder and then pulls it out of history and off the streets uh, and into the phone and then produces this pornified uh, house as he puts it. So in relationship to this, we have to think uh, about the bulldozing activity of improvement that moved people like uh, Sylvia Rivera uh, out of the piers and made way for these new uh, buildings that now house golf courses and, and health clubs. And by the way, there's a great essay by uh, Ivan Lopez uh, Munera in Eflux's uh, Sick Architecture section on Sylvia 
uh, Rivera that I really recommend people uh, read. And she herself is the kind of disobedient um, uh, subject wandering through the peers at that moment and testifying to what is pulled down uh, when the peers are demolished uh, as part of the Hudson River Park Conservancy uh, project. So we want to move away from the bulldozing activity of improvement, uh, get away from the uh, extractive behavior of Grinder, and go back and think with Alvin Baltrop about the collapsed architecture that removes us from the frame of heteronormative domesticity that places even the bodies of gay men that now become the sites of uh, capitalist accumulation, puts them on a slant and demands that in fact, we look at the site of collapse itself, at the angular, the slanting, the bending, the collapsing forms of a former world for signs and clues as to how to get out of that suffocating heteronormative frame and into a different world altogether. Anna, you're muted. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, I speak to you from the land of the Huancavita, which is also coincidentally one of the lands of the banana, three degrees uh, south of the equator in front of the Pacific Ocean. In politics do not happen in squares, and this how chaos unravels the public and private dichotomy from both ends. The publicness of the so-called private domestic sphere hacked and rendered public and idea of disobedience. And the private conversations that were needed to transform the public space of Seoul Square. By untangling these, the various ways in which folks repurpose the private space of their home. And this reveals the domestic as a site of labor, struggle and resistance. Traits traditionally associated with the public sphere. I first met Andres when I reached out to him in 2012 to publish his work in an issue of the journal Thresholds, which I edited at, at MIT. And we share an interest in the spatial politics of the public and the ways in which human and non-human dis non disobedient agents can inform the construction of these politics. In a recent interview, Andres shared his conviction that, I quote, no political action happens without invading and being performed in networks of domestic environments, unquote. Indeed, in returning to this essay for today's event, I was surprised by the prescience and the relevance that it has and holds to our current Zoom reality, a reality in which the spaces of public discourse simultaneously display the privacy of our homes or align them through the virtual backgrounds, revealing our resistance to this enforced sharing. Well, those of us who have the privilege of access to a job that can be carried online, a space to work from, and reliable internet are able to carry on. Vulnerable populations or populations on the brink of vulnerability have been starkly revealed. And here I show you Leslie Jones, who has now uh, turned a uh, comedian who has now turned into an architectural critic of the backgrounds that folks interviewed by MSNBC reveal. Um, the pandemic reveals the precarity of gender roles, our need to care for children and aging parents, access to technology and reliable internet, or just to a quiet and comfortable space to work in. Politics do not happen in squares. They happen in our kitchens, bedrooms, bathrooms, and living rooms. Last fall at the University of Michigan, where I work, the Graduate Employees Organization, or GEO, organized a strike, which is illegal uh, in Michigan, for a safe and just campus. Students demanded safety and the right to work remotely and additional support due to COVID. And they also, and in response to the increased policing of the campus population to supposedly ensure proper mask wearing, they demanded justice for BIPOC communities by decreased funding and disarming of the campus police. But how to strike in the times of COVID? GEO organized simultaneous in-person and online picket shifts so that students, faculty, and staff in solidarity could join in either physically distant protests or organize Zoom rooms in which students led teach outs on the demands and details of the strike. They also reached out internally to undergraduate students, staff, and faculty in solidarity 
and organized private Zoom rooms for discussions that extended their platforms to create a solidarity across ranks. The fact that this organizing labor and the withdrawal of labor that constituted the strike happened within the domestic sphere calls upon the work of Titi Bhattacharya, who in explaining social reproduction theory asks us, if workers produce commodities, who produces the workers? But the Charya is interested in how the social processes of the production of labor power are connected to and implicated with the social processes that produce the commodity. Thus, she questions what happens before the worker arrives to her workplace and after she leaves it. The spaces where the worker sleeps, eats, and regenerates her labor power. But what happens when the space of reproduction of the reproduction of labor is conflated with the space of labor itself? And what avenues does the worker have for protest in this reality? Here's where Andres's work holds important answers. Rather than examine the spaces of a heteronormative, supposedly average and therefore white family with two and a half kids, Andres understands that the savviest actors in navigating the conflated domestic and labor spheres are those familiar with transgression. In other words, it is precisely those most vulnerable actors that have developed the tactics to bypass the normative modes imposed by power and privilege. Thus Theo embarking on a process of gender reassignment convenes neighbors and makes them sensitive to LGBTQIA plus realities. And male protesters at Seoul Square discussed Judith Butler and wore t-shirts identifying as female sex workers. And as I have suggested, graduate students engaged in an illegal strike generated spaces of conversation that allowed them to confront the power of the university. And this is work engages the ways in which human and non-human disobedient actors negotiate these spaces and processes and situate themselves in relation to each other. This work traces these discursive networks and the spatial politics that they produce. Congratulations, Andres, James, and GSAPT team.
Thank you, Andres, for this incredible book. Uh, I love all the projects in it, but I'm going to respond to chapter 12, Sex and the So-Called City. Sex and the So-Called City brilliantly describes the city as a factory of desire an energy intensive simulation 
fueled by natural gas and the biological labor of human bodies, sex workers and surrogates. This is not in fact a city, not a site of habitation, but an image apparatus, a series of frames and stages that culminate in the Instagram square ultra blue windows of 432 Park Avenue, the perfect icy background for a cocky boy or a model slash dancer. In this performance, no one stays for long. The real estate client will return to Russia, the fertility patients to China, the models and surrogates back to the hinterlands. The evacuated city is a city of speculation reduced to a series of assets. But what if the parties involved in this commodification of desire refuse to part ways when the sale is done? What if the prospective parents moved in with the contracted surrogate after the baby's birth to become a throuple? What if the porn actor settled into the wide window queen studio, turning the set into a squat? What if the billionaire opened her condominium doors to the makeup artists, stylists, lighting engineers, and photographers who created the real estate tableau that lured her into the building in the first place? And what if the people displaced from the Susquehanna River Basin, driven out by polluted air and poisoned water, arrived en masse over the George Washington Bridge and through the Lincoln and Holland Tunnels to New York? In 2016, I traveled to Susquehanna County to seek out the source of New York's energy in the Marcellus Shale. This was just after the US presidential elections and I was confronted with another displacement, Trump signs, uh, Trump's name synonymous with New York real estate emblazoned on barns, trucks and lawn signs. On returning to New York, I envisioned bringing a piece of the Marcellus Shale back, back to New York City, not just the gas as extracted commodity, but the earth itself. Three gas pipelines enter Manhattan from under the Hudson River in the West Village, the Upper West Side, and West Harlem. Here in an unrealized proposal, a fragment of the Susquehanna landscape, the Marcellus Shale, bathed in the light of its own fire, erupt from beneath the pavement at these three locations. A portion of the 500 billion cubic feet of gas consumed by the city per year is released at the site where these pipes puncture the city's skin. As New York displaces toxicity to the Susquehanna, here, a fragment of that distant and unseen landscape emerges from the seams of the city's grid. Thank you. So it's an honor to be asked to contribute to this conversation on the release of Superpowers of Scales. So I thought for my allotted time, I'd narrate an encounter with one of the works in the book. Its bronze, greens, and organza-like mesh have been sewn to form floor slabs, towers, trees, communication towers, and other elements of an otherwise unremarkable urban landscape. A gossamer field of clear plastic threads held up its architectural set piece of what I began to understand through its visual narrative represented Milano II a development envisioned and financed by Silvio Bunga Bunga Berlusconi, located 10 miles outside of its doppelganger, Milan. In the essay included in Superpowers of Scale, Andreas reminds us that, quote, it is often forgotten that his, Berlusconi's, particular way of reinventing the relationship between politics and media was an architectural invention developed and tested through the interiors, buildings, landscapes, and urbanisms to which he and his team devoted a large part of their time and resources from the late 1960s to the early 1990s." End quote. Projected into the intimate spaces of this ephemeral diorama was a series of vignette gifs that told the story of how the number ones, a sort of Stepford class quote of ambitious, young, middle-class, family-oriented executives, end quote, came to dwell in this carefully mediated televisual urbanism 
of Milano II. On the day of my encounter with sales oddity Milano II and the politics of direct to home TV urbanism in the arsenale at the Venice Biennale, I found its flickering narrative of GIFs simultaneously disconcerting and transfixing. In comparison to the extra, extra large HVAC plinth of stiff and jutting ducts, a construction that dwarfed and dominated all those who dare cross the threshold of the central pil pavilion of the Giardini and an expression of the fundamental category of ceiling expounded by the Biennale's curator, Rim Kulhas, sales oddity was refreshingly extra, extra small. Its form was delicate, and I would even venture to say its stitched constructions evoke the feminine. But if it were a she, girl was messy, imperfect, and certainly in the context of capital F fundamental architecture, girl was a bit unruly. To dwell in the interstices between architecture and politics necessitates disobedience, requires being undisciplined. That interest in the wayward, the recalcitrant, the unmanageable, that might be found elsewhere and underground are the sites where the Office for Political Innovation practices. As Andreas writes about his architectural education in one of the premier programs in Spain, one that thought to dissemble the connection between architecture and politics, he said he had to, quote, unlearn and disobey at some's push for alignment to situate design as a questioning and dissident mode of critical practice, end quote. Well, that comes as no surprise since architects labor within educational institutions and professional organizations whose correctional regimes discipline us with a host of regulations, policies, canons, rules, and laws. Their delineations of competency and mastery keep us ensconced in our disciplinary silos so that we may eventually rise to the positions of head, dean, chair, fellow, director, principal, and critic. In the role of administrators, we dedicate ourselves to maintaining the order of things, of patriarchy, of whiteness, and of heteronormity. Works like Sales Oddity explicates how architects like Giancarlo Carlo, Ravazzi and his fellow collaborators conceived and produced spaces like Milano II, wrought from a host of state-sanctioned policies, like codes formed at the behest of private interest. Making policy, like the standards that govern global construction industry and the codes that legislate how cities and buildings are built, is a process that pronounces anything that deviates from the proper, as Fred Moten and Stephen Harley remind us, Har Harney reminds us, as incorrect and illegal. The role of policy, after all, is to police. It is correctional. Andreas and his collaborators make architectures of, for, and about queer, trans, disabled, black, brown, sex workers, maintenance workers, and other familial arrangements. Their desires, played out in IKEA disobedience, are formed and informed by improvised existence, one found in the everyday spaces seen and heard in the basement of the Barcelona Pavilion and in basement, basement apartments around London. I find that Andreas engages in what Tina Camp calls a praxis of futurity, where the marginal, the quiet, and the quotidian practices of everyday life um, gears toward the creation of alternative futures. By being disobedient, unruly, and undisciplined, these communities, one shared through the various projects assembled in the superpowers of scale, refuses the terms of sub subjugation and works toward freedom elsewhere. Congratulations, Andreas and his team and GSAP Books for this substantial and important volume. Thank you. Hello, uh, I would like to start by congratulating uh, Andres on the publication of this book. Uh, this is a fantastic achievement uh, and a truly important contribution to our field. Uh, the superpower of scale uh, puts forward a very innovative understanding of architecture's role as 
compositional, not just critical or material, but compositional. Uh, it illustrates architects' power to mobilize and extend gatherings of heterogeneous entities that operate at different scales. Andres goes uh, confidently against both uh, technological determinism and social determinism and questions architectural delusional uh, desires uh, for these two perspectives. And I think this is a great achievement of the book. Uh, the alternative is a multiverse, to use the term of uh, William James, and the multiversal aspect of contemporary existence is unpacked in this book with anthropological uh, sensitivity and architectural virtuosity. Um, the book offers a novel understanding of the political dimension of architecture, and I think this is uh, its greatest uh, contribution. Um, it's a, a perspective inspired by pragmatist philosophy, uh, science studies, and the material turn uh, in humanities. Uh, a number of projects lead us to unearth a range of implicit theories about the political. And we literally witness how politics transpires in design, domestic, construction sites, and many other sites, which are often unrelated to the tra traditional sites of political action. We usually think of politics as, uh, as an activity that happens in the headquarters of political parties, on uh, squares, in uh, street demonstrations and petitions. Uh, but here we are invited to witness politics as it unfolds on many different sites, non-traditional sites of politics. And let me take you to some of those uh, sites. Um, in chapter four, and the slide that you see here is an example from chapter four, is titled 12 Actions to Make Peter Eisenman Transparent. Um, here in uh, this project, uh, the Office for Political Innovation was hired to design a wooden fence uh, to conceal what was a very ugly and unpleasantly looking construction site uh, in Galicia back in 2001 uh, for the project, um, for a project that was under construction, the, pro the City of Culture of Galicia, a project by uh, Peter Eisenman. So instead of designing a building or a fence, an object, uh, Andres's practice uh, devised 12 different strategies, uh, which are adjustments uh, in the site, interventions uh, on the site. Uh, and uh, these strategies uh, engage uh, the general public uh, and invite the general public to experience uh, the construction site. Uh, they make it public. Um, and by so doing, uh, they entirely de black box the construction process. We uh, witness different uh, events um, uh, that provide access to the site, uh, uh, to the site of construction, different bus lines taking the public to visit the construction, different events, uh, different color coding uh, uh, structures are in place, uh, color coding and screens are placed in different locations to explain economic and uh, logistic aspect of the construction that otherwise will remain invisible for the public. Um, and uh, we also witnessed different strategies uh, devised um, by uh, the Office uh, for Political Innovation to collect and archive individual opinions uh, that uh, will be then mobilized in debate. So all these actions, uh, which are very different than just designing an object or a building, are actions that involve research, uh, uh, raising issues, detecting alternatives, describing and redescribing material practices, and they are powerful devices for mobilizing collective action. We see here that at the level of uh, the practice of construction, both the political and the architectural get decomposed to a myriad of small elements, fluid and unstable, fragile and composite. The political emerges as an underlying dimension of construction practices that can only be grasped by following how they unfold. And this is a great achievement of this project because we, we really witness how construction processes unfold and are, are made visible. Another side of politics, which was discussed by other colleagues previously, 
Um, uh, and this is chapter five I'm referring, a title with the pro provocative, uh, uh, provocatively politics does not happen in squares. Uh, here in this chapter, Andres invites us convince him, uh, con uh, to witness other sides of politics, like the, the politics domesticity uh, is uh, largely discussed with the uh, project IKEA disobediences and here the home becomes a site of politics of protest of disobedience against the global power the global agency of IKEA uh, similarly public squares are not uh, just neutral spaces where politics just happens uh, but the Spanish Revolution in 2011 on Seoul Square illustrates the amazing number of uh, diverse architectural devices, uh, spaces, technologies, books, t-shirts, performances, practices that all have to be put together, connected and mobilized uh, to be able to enact a certain type of uh, protest of political action. And uh, Andres shows this in an amazingly uh, detailed and convincing way. So the book uh, uh, offers fresh insights on the various political modalities of architecture and can serve as an invitation uh, to political scientists to explore the possibilities, the possibilities of other ways of doing uh, politics architecturally, designerly ways. At the same time, in our field, in the field of design and architecture, it could inspire a more political kind of practice. I would like to also highlight two additional contributions of Andres's work. First, um, and um, we, you can see this on uh, this uh, beautiful slide, Andres also acts as an anthropologist, not just an architect in uh, this book. And we witness, um, he tells us stories about uh, this, the personal lives of the different actors. Uh, and here we see them in their homes. Uh, and these are anthropological stories. We witness that anthropology is not just reserved any longer to study uh, the others, the exotic others, but as we have never been modern, it can be also oriented to us. And that's what Andres does uh, in, an, in an extraordinary way with uh, an exceptional finesse of an established anthropologist, I would say. And in the spirit of a reversed exotism, he tests the very nature of the relations um, in uh, domestic, public, ecological, and many other fields of existence. So he demonstrates uh, convincingly that there's no framing out there. There is no context, external context out there. There's no uh, uh, Galician politics or Spanish society out there capable of explaining what happens on the construction site uh, of Eisenman's uh, building. Each time we design, everything is to be redesigned, as everything is to be retold, uh, both content and context. And second, uh, this non-modernist attitude uh, invites us also to take seriously uh, the key question of change of scale as we cannot externalize anymore, as there is not context that explains this. Uh, we, we only witness the, the swift change of scales as also um, demonstrated by other speakers uh, today. It's impossible to distinguish what is bigger and what is smaller. The global, uh, as we beautifully see in the book, is uh, uh, also uh, to be relocated and redistributed many times. Uh, the macro no longer um, describes a larger site uh, in which the micro would be embedded, but it's another equally local uh, place, uh, like the domestic space, like the construction site. And they're all connected, they're all related. Uh, so we witness uh, a very uh, uh, deep relational uh, world, uh, uh, thanks to Andres. Uh, thus, in a way, Andres Hake also uh, rethinks modernism, just like Bruno Latour uh, in uh, philosophy, but Andres does this uh, with uh, different architectural uh, resources, and I hope that other architects uh, will be willing uh, to follow suit. Thank you and congratulations, Andres.
Andres, can we invite you to have the, the first word after these incredible presentations? Well, thank you very much. Uh, this, this is overwhelming, like uh, the amount of uh, 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 intelligent comments on the work that it's and on the book, on, on the work that the book uh, uh, gathers. Uh, it's uh, kind of overwhelming. At the same time, I have the feeling that the, uh, the, uh, the book is part of a process of uh, conversations, connections, discussions with others. And it's very exciting to see that that is continued to this event, that the uh, conversations can be expanded and it's they're reversed. And, and I, I want to refer to a number of comments about design, because I think that this is uh, and uh, maybe starting with this comment by Albena Yaneva uh, about design as a compositional practice. Uh, and I, I, for me, this is, this is crucial. Uh, in, in the, uh, of course, we, we often see in schools of architecture to think of architecture as a, or design as something that has to do with function, with creation of uh, uh, neutral containers that can contain the social, uh, and in my opinion, the great capacity of architecture is the capacity for recomposition, for composition, for intervene reality in uh, redefining or empowering, uh, 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 challenging, uh, operating, instigating, uh, and making more likely, less likely uh, forms of uh, interconnection and entanglement. And I, I think this is my opinion. I. I very much uh, admire the work of Albena Yaneva, and I think that it's something that we've been discussing for years now. And that, and in my opinion, when 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 we see images like uh, IKEA disobedience, this composition of objects, uh, it's in a way uh, the most direct way to intervene uh, existing connections and find a way to uh, rearticulate them, to open them, to to destabilize them. And this compositional aspect of architecture, in my opinion, going to Keller's uh, insistence that this is design, uh, it's, it's, it's quite relevant because in a way, both the idea that architecture can correct reality that is wrong or be a vehicle of uh, pre predetermined uh, programs to be enacted or injected into the social or the idea of the container, uh, architecture being a kind of the, the capacity of contain any form of the social or even the idea of the autonomy of buildings and the even the possibility of have a program of their own. As much as the uh, 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 disappointment of architecture not having an absolute political agency, I think are basically uh, the ideas by which architecture often is connected with uh, the, the, the notions of politics. And there's a great potential for me to, to see uh, design in this compositional way and, uh, and thinking of design of something that is uh, uh, developing specific forms of agency that are different each time that it is practiced. Maybe this could be in a way a beginning of this uh, second part of the conversation, but I'm sure that James, you will have many things to say. No, I mean, I, I think we could actually absolutely depart from, uh, from that as a provocation. I was also thinking during these uh, presentations that as an editor, it's, it's always a thrill to uh, see responses to a book because you can finally start to understand what it is that, that you've done and what, what the sort of effects uh, that this book and this work uh, might have on the discipline. And that's something that I, I sort of also wanted to, to put on the table is to sort of ask uh, what it is that, that this book as a sort of object like can do uh, within, within the discipline. And I, I was thinking particularly about how often uh, the speakers invoked uh, the idea of seeing or, or witnessing, sort of uh, training a kind of consciousness, a kind of uh, a, a perception. Uh, I'm thinking of Keller's uh, line that, that the book sort of populates a world that runs counter to the one we give so much authority to. And I'm also thinking of Anna Maria's uh, extremely important note that it's the most uh, vulnerable actors uh, who tend to be the ones that generate uh, the most potent uh, responses to the challenges that the normative state of architecture gives us. And so for me, one of the questions that I had in, in reading this, 
or in following these presentations was, uh, you know, what are the sort of effects on uh, the audience of these projects? Uh, and it will, of course, I think vary greatly depending on the sort of positionality of the person perceiving it, but like, does it cultivate us uh, to sort of uh, uh, bring out our own modes of disobedience, uh, which might be in some way latent? Uh, does it instead cultivate a sense of humility for uh, the field in recognizing the ways that, that architecture sort of neutralizes and tames those modes of disobedience uh, and kind of stifles them? Or for that matter, uh, is the reader meant to be primed uh, not so much to the kind of proclaimed ideas of what architecture thinks it does, but rather to the sort of the side effects, the, uh, the, the unspoken uh, connections uh, and dispossessions and deprivations that, that architecture uh, creates. And so that for me was certainly one of my uh, 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 questions as I was listening to these fantastic responses to the book as well. jump in and say that I, I, I really do agree this, with this idea that designing is sort of moving through, jostling things into further entanglements. Um, but I, I think that one of the things that may, um, just to respond to your comment, James, one of the things that I think a reader can't fail to also uh, receive from the book is something of a temperament in in doing this there's a there's a gentle temperament in the way that jostling occurs that um, it, it it might not be expressed but I, but I think it transfers to any reader I I would think I I would follow up on that quickly say I I, I feel uh, several of us have noted, uh, I, I read it also in Keller's introduction, this lightness of touch or what Albena described as an anthropological uh, approach that I, I know I'm going to use uh, with my students. Uh, it's it just the, the, the it, it's something that Andres makes uh, look very easy, but it's so difficult uh, in approaching uh, different populations in, in various states of vulnerability. Uh, this sort of ha has traditionally been a really problematic uh, relationship between uh, architects and, you know, and, and uh, a public that is considered other. And yet Andres manages to do it in a way in which uh, there's a sense of um, collegiality uh, in relation with um, the publics that he situates himself in conversation with uh, rather than um, you know, a, a, a distance or a separation. And I, I think to me that's uh, 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 really difficult, uh, but, but a, a huge value um, of his work. I think what's so interesting about your compositional technique is just how heterogeneous the elements of that technique are and how that heterogeneity requires like so many new kinds of knowledge and kind of techniques um, and a kind of intimacy and richness and texture of understanding becomes so, so important. Um, and I just love that in the book, all of those kinds of textures come through and new kinds of attentiveness come through. And there's a kind of simultaneity to all of these levels and all of these kind of elements um, of your work that requires this kind of uh, yeah, these multiple levels and, and sort of of this very kind of high degree of sensitivity in order to understand how a composition has these sort of multitude of effects. And that the architect too is embedded in those networks. Yeah, I agree. It's a very interesting aspect of the composition. And uh, we, in addition to seeing many invisible actors that we'll usually not see being involved in the making of architecture from the technologies and the fragile body as Beatrice uh, was um, developing this argument true to the cat, 
that we will never see in the Miss van der Rohe pavilion and all these hidden objects in the cellar uh, and uh, many the many other different beings with different ontology that are literally taken out of those hidden places, out of different black boxes of different nature and uh, and made visible. So it's it's an amazing uh, way of uh, making visible, making public, but also showing the ingredients of this composition. And on the other hand, Andres is also very honest because he also uh, shows us the tools the, the tools, the tools and the techniques of the architect, the toolkit is also made visible in a way. And we can see also the ingredients of his architectural um, technique. So, uh, and that's why it's so varied. And these two compositions are also kind of mixed uh, and the composition is amplified because we can see him working and thinking uh, through these different hidden objects and techniques that suddenly become visible and are amplified and their being is amplified with uh, the hidden uh, architectural toolkit, toolkit made visible uh, again and mixed in the composition. I think there is this kind of double movement in a way, double composition is movement in your technique as a thinker and as a designer as well. On this theme of visibility, we had a, a, a question from the audience uh, about the question of representation, which I think has been alluded to at many points during the day, but maybe uh, Andres, you could offer some explicit thoughts. Uh, the question is what architectural modes of representation enable our participation in the sort of compositional dimensional active form that's being described here? Maybe this is something that could be a discussion uh, because I think that the, the, uh, the question about representation is, uh, something that it's been emerging throughout the, the different presentations. Uh, in a way, uh, what, what I could say that uh, it's uh, often the, the idea of, the, of representation in architecture has to do with the idea of kind of mirroring or creating an image of something that exists and uh, like uh, representation being a subsidiary of the, that image. I, I have the feeling that it's uh, the, the, there's a possibility also of thinking of images, uh, settings, uh, installations as architecture in itself and, and uh, that it's already operating politically or relationally, uh, both as uh, an opportunity to, to, uh, to perform politically, but also as a way to, to uh, inter interconnect with others. I think that for instance, uh, when we were doing the Barcelona Pavilion installation, uh, the fact that we took the, uh, the the vacuum cleaner to the lake, it was totally transforming the way the Barcelona operated. It was, of course, a way to to challenge the 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 hierarchies, the visual hierarchies of the pavilion. But immediately it meant that the people that are using the vacuum cleaner became the curators of the pavilion. They have to explain what were the moments in which the pavilion could be open, when should be closed, where is the moment that the exhibition was prepared to be seen, and what is the moment in which it was in the making. And all those hierarchies even ended up with huge political problems, like some of the employees, their work became so much on the spot that they have difficulties with their supervisors. Uh, that would start to have uh, uh, to have to develop a focus on them and were uh, following them throughout the pavilion to see if they were doing things properly. So for me, the divide between representation and sort of uh, uh, technopolitical uh, uh, action, uh, I think, needs to be questioned and to to be seen as something that is part of the same set of actions. I think this is something that has been through the discussion. And I think that it's something that refers to many of the works, like the way Daniel Barber, for instance, was explaining the making of climate, uh, uh, right? Like representation was something that could not be divided to the very production of climate. I think that's what's so interesting about performance is in mean, performance art is that an action is both an action and has this representational dimension as well. And I think so much of your work has that, that kind of performative aspect to it. It does something. Mm -hmm. I might also put uh, the other audience comment uh, on the table, which is, 
has to do with uh, supply chains. And I think part of what's, uh, of course, so fantastic about this work is the way it connects uh, subjective, uh, individual, personal uh, beings and experiences with architecture to the, the sort of most infrastructural planetary scales of how architecture happens. And the question here uh, from the audience was if supply chains uh, underlie these sorts of relationships across the scales of architecture, uh, as in the case of Ikea and the banana uh, alike, two excellent protagonists to have during the day, uh, corporate contracts and trade agreements orchestrate these supply chains. How can architects organize to demand the decolonization and decarbonization of these practices? So it, it's, as I read this question, on the one hand, we have, you know, the question of how, how do we learn to see differently? Uh, and on the other, how do we sort of mobilize um, uh, against these sorts of infrastructures? Tay wanted, right? Or, uh, I actually I, think Tay might have been waving goodbye and a, uh, we, we, we will need to be respectful of everybody's time. So it, we should wrap up fairly soon, but. So maybe uh, this is something I could refer to uh, alone and Daniel, right? Like you just opened, for instance, this project on Salmon. I wonder what is the way that you probably could tell us as well, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think it's an excellent question. And, and in many ways, I think architecture and, and as a practice, like build logistics and build supply chains and and constructs and puts forward infrastructures and in the process of or the process of decarbonization and decolonization can can take place through like architecture and today it's it I think from the way we approach it like the practice kind of requires for that to take place so. As Andres was referring with the case of salmon, I think it's how do we find moments to intervene within cultural institutions and within kind of spaces that basically allow us to remove, like in the project we just now did the Tate, to remove salmon off all of its men all the menus across the country. And in the process, you really start kind of changing kind of both the perception, I guess, of the audience and basically the different structures and protocols of these institutions. And at the same time, how do we kind of create spaces of regenerative agriculture, regenerative aquaculture that I think it, at their basis could be kind of pushing to a decarbonized and decolonial worlds. And, and I think also, I think Perhaps we can see, Andres, your methodology of these kind of interscalar ways of looking at the world, almost as a methodology to, to trace all these connections, right? So the moment you start looking at things from a microscopic to a planetary level, you are able to understand how an atom might be connected to a shipping route, right? And, and, and how perhaps the making of an IKEA furniture also deals with um, constructions or or perceptions of a normalized body. Um, and the moment I think we start looking at things through through those connections also allows for a lot of possibilities for intervention. Mm -hmm. I wonder what it's, I mean, I love- yeah. Andres, can I just offer quickly, I mean, both in the in the book and also in the, in the way that um, you just described in reference to the question, you know, I think in addition to the sort of organizing in the streets and on the phones and on the screens, right? I mean, which is to say the question of sort of how do we collectivize and organize? And I think part of what we're demonstrating is through media, right? I mean, through images, through understanding these supply chains, through the sort of depth of the research and its kind of forms of elaboration and dissemination, right? That these become galvanizing tools to, to frame uh, social resource processes in, in different ways, right? So just the sort of premise of media as the space of organization, I think it's becomes a yeah rich rich space in this book and also of course in the fabulous work that Cooking Sections just described. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I have, it is, oh. please, no, Michael, please go ahead. I just thought that the linking of the particular glass um, in 432 Park Avenue to this kind of counterintuitive relationship to uh, atmospheric pollution shows that there's also a role in terms of even finding these connections that might be hidden 
to understand what the kind of environmental impacts of an architecture might be that might not be immediately obvious that is a part of a kind of activism. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, I, I wonder what's the way that also Jack's called for these uh, ruins and the, the way things decay and see, it's also something, uh, in my opinion, this an architecture, like the, the, the moment of breaking the class or the, it's, it's something that somehow it's been challenging architectural practices and the way that it uh, 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 operated. And when you are describing it, Jack, you also talk of the way bodies are connected to this decaying environment of the peers, right? Yeah, well, I was, I mean, I was just trying to think about these frames that we can't see it, that nonetheless determine the ways in which we are oriented to the environment. And of course, the, there's been just a super romantic uh, look back at the peers as if they were some sort of utopian space, right? Um, and we have to sort of celebrate this sexual exchange that went on there. But I think, I think one of the things that Scale does in your book is chart some kind of connection between the restless cruising in one area and then the uploading of that cruising into a capitalist algorithm in another era. And it's quite mysterious as to how that happens, but it's important not to miss the moment that it does happen because it tells us everything about, you know, what Preciado calls the pharmacopornographic, the relationship between these different structures of the erotic and the ecstatic and capital. Mm -hmm. the, the movie that Jack called me Satter White Sowed, it's a movie that was basically the moment that this was happening in Grindr. The moment that they wanted to sell the 50% the of the, of the uh, shares of the company and therefore they had to rebrand themselves, not as queer, but as a lifestyle platform. And that was the moment that they did this party uh, during the uh, Gay Pride in the uh, Standard Hotel uh, in the, what was called the Liberty Suite. And Jacobi was hired to do organize this party that ended up like a huge mess and uh, uh, everyone kind of fighting because basically uh, Grindr brought their PRs and that was a mess because they were trying to bring queer people into the Liberty Suite and they of course uh, were uh, disruptive and then they got uh, very uh, annoyed by the fact that they were th those people were not following the mandates of the PRs, uh, but eventually that resulted in uh, I, in Grinder selling this property, uh, selling fifty percent of the company, and then this guy Joyce and Kai buying this huge mansion in in uh, Hollywood. So the the entire moment of that huge crisis in which Grinder was operating and turning into a platform for lifestyle and gayness became this something that is totally non-queer uh, through real estate, it's very much reflected in that particular party that uh, Jacobi was part of. And that was the way we met. And then years later, the Whitechapel Galleries offered us to do a work together. We basically reproduced the problems of that party. I love that story because it so fully connects the, the individual to the infrastructural at the absolute scale of capitalism. I think perhaps we should leave it there. We have some other comments rolling in, questions about how uh, these sorts of uh, ideas about media connect to the current moment, how we can sort of further the work of abolitionist politics and decolonial efforts, all of which I think are latent, uh, er, not latent, like explicitly active within the book and within many of these comments here. But out of respect for uh, the time uh, of, of our speakers, knowing that everybody probably has the next Zoom to go to, uh, perhaps we should close here, but uh, what a treat uh, for everybody. Andres, any, any final words from you before we uh, well, Thanks out? so much to everyone. Let's continue doing things and discussing together. So thank you all so much uh, to our panelists and our audience for joining us today. <laughs>